Um, well, first, I just wanted to thank, uh, thank Oxford Nanopore for inviting me to come today. I've learned so much at this conference already. It's always a great conference to come to. So today, I'm going to talk about bacteriophages and um, how we can use genomics to really start building these better um, phage cocktails. And if you've been to other talks you've seen, uh, especially this morning, um, that antimicrobial resistance is a problem. We're starting to see lots of deaths per year, 23,000 deaths per year in the US alone, and 700,000 deaths worldwide. And we don't really have a solution for this. Um, current trends are going to have this skyrocketing by 2050. And if you look at how long it takes for um, an antibiotic to come into existence and then to, um, to gain resistance, for resistance genes to emerge, it um, happens very quickly. And yet it takes a really long time to find a new antibiotic to try to um, combat this new, this new bug. And so at EpiBiome, we're working with bacteriophages. These are viruses that only infect bacteria. So you can see one up here. And what's neat about them is that they're very specific. So what they do is they come in and they try to find a bacterial cell to hit. Um, and so uh, since they're looking for structures on the surface, they um, will often only hit a species or maybe just certain strains in a species. So you can have a very targeted antimicrobial, which is good, but it's also why it's taken so long to use them because they're a lot harder to engineer since you don't know, um, if you don't know what the person has, it can be difficult to treat them with um, phages. So after the phage recognizes the cell and injects the DNA into the cell, takes over, builds lots of baby phages, which then explode the cell, killing it, and allowing it to exponentially amplify and go find other um, bacterial cells, um, pathogenic cells, to kill. And here is a nice little movie of this. So at time zero, we put the phage and the bacteria together. And so you'll see this is phase contrast image of the bacteria. In around 50 minutes, you'll see the bacteria actually dying um, from phage infection. Okay, so phages have been around for a long time. We've known about them for 100 years. These are pictures of the Durrell Laboratory um, finding phages. And um, these are actually, this is a lawn of bacteria, and these are phage plaques that are on it. So they've been around, and if you look now, there are still people working on it, but um, basically they're doing the same thing. The only difference is the pictures are now in color. Um, so at EpiBiome, we're trying to take a different approach, which is to truly really try to use high throughput automation and genomics together to build these cocktails, thinking this will be a game changer for the technology. And so what you're seeing here is our robot, which has automated the phage discovery process. So we can get a sewage sample or soil sample or any kind of sample where there might be a high phage population and go through all the steps it takes to get an isolated phage out the end, which we can then sequence. And the goal is to find all the phages in the world, which there are 10 to the 32nd of them, so we have our work cut out for us and we have a job for a while. Um, what's really interesting for me being on doing genomics at EpiBiome is that we're creating this large phage library, so we're going to have a lot of bacteria, we're going to have a lot of phages, but how do we choose the right ones to put in this cocktail? And that's where I think genomics really helps us, is to guide the design of our cocktails. So here is um, some early results from our company. So We've done manual discovery for a while, and then we really just stopped, so okay, we've really got to develop this automation platform. And you can see that um, immediately upon turning it on, we just started generating lots and lots of hits. Um, and so this is even without full optimization, so we think this will even get faster with time. And so now that we have all these phages, let's figure out what they're actually doing. Um, so we received some money, and we um, worked in close collaboration with Matt Sullivan's lab on this project, which was looking at enterotoxinogenic E. coli. It causes um, infections of the gut in um, infants in the developing world and also uh, traveler's diarrhea. What we were interested in is um, when you have a bacterial cell, uh, one of two things happens when you add a phage. Either one, the phage finds its target and amplifies and kills the cell. Or two, the bacterial cell somehow evades the phage. In this case, I'm showing that it couldn't um, find a target receptor on the surface. And so now you've got a resistant mutant. These we call bacteriophage insensitive mutants. Now what we were interested in is how is the bacterial cell evading the phage? If you sequence these BIMs, you can um, look at the genes that change and understand the interaction between the phage and the bacteria. Um, 
And so that's what we needed to do. We needed to sequence both the phage susceptible and the phage resistant mutants to understand this interaction. Now the hope is that as we, um, as we do this um, sequencing and understand these interactions, we might be able to pick phages that actually preferentially um, cause the bacteria to become less virulent when they become less, when they become phage resistant. So if you see a correlation there, then you can actually push your cocktails to, um, to be much better. That even if, you, even if you gain resistance, then it's actually a less virulent form of the bacteria, so you may be less sick. OK, so um, I've learned a lot at this conference. I actually probably would change the slide based on a lot of the stuff I learned yesterday. But um, we, were, we were really excited to use the Menion just to get complete bacterial genomes. And what we found was that we immediately got a great genome upon using um, the Menion with our MySeq data. And we used a lot of data. So um, what I did was go back and I said, how much data did I really need to use? And I thought this would be interesting for the user conference. So what I did was um, took different amounts of Minan sequence data, but used all my MySeq data um, with the Spades de Novo, uh, Spades de Novo hybrid assembler. And um, what I found was that I could get away with about 18x coverage, actually 13x coverage of um, the Minion data and still get my complete genome. The length was the same. Um, but I will say, now we have the unicycler um, writer in the audience, that um, I played with that last night. I think I could even get away with less data using that. So I'm excited to see how far this can get pushed because we're really interested to sequence a lot of bacterial strains. Um, okay, so once I got the de novo assembly, the next step was to call variants. And so I used a pipeline called BreSeq to look at the differences between variants in the um, control phage susceptible bacteria and the um, resistant mutants. So um, what I found was that the phage susceptible colonies didn't have any variants, which was good. Um, I actually made my assembly off of them, so that kind of makes sense. <laughs> um, but when I looked at the, um, the phage resistant ones, and I have um, a set of mutants against two different phages, in this case P004H, and this one is P0057. Then I started um, seeing uh, some variants. And I actually don't see variants for all of them. The ones that are uncolored, this beige color, I didn't, actually didn't see any variants in. But the ones that are colored have variants in LPS heptacyl transferase, this bifunctional protein. In this case, it was an O-antigen ligase, hydropterin synthase, and dehydroramnose. <clears throat> so what's nice about these genes is I actually saw a variety of genes. I never saw the same variant twice. And even for these ones that had the same gene called, they were actually very different variants. Um, one of these was the loss of a start codon. The other one was a really large deletion by 392 base pairs. <clears throat> now, when we looked at what these genes really do, we found that four out of five of the genes are in, uh, involved in the LPS biosynthesis pathway. And so what we, um, what we think is happening, and this is not uncommon in um, phage literature, is that you're taking the um, LPS, this lipopolysaccharide layer on the outside in your cell, and um, you're actually pulling off the O antigen by knocking out these genes. And there are variants, um, there are deletion mutants in the literature that show this will happen. And so what's interesting about this is that we were able to um, identify the most likely mechanism for how this phage is, um, how this bacteria is evading these phages. We actually think it's the same mechanism because when we looked at these BIMs, they were actually resistant to this phage, and these BIMs were also resistant to that phage. So that tells us that they, these would not be good phages to put together, because if you become resistant to one, you become resistant to both. And so we think this is gonna be a great tool to really understand how to guide our cocktail design going forward. Um, so in summary, we've identified the mechanism for, um, most likely mechanism for how these strains are becoming resistant to, um, how the strains are becoming resistant to these two phages. But we have a lot of phages. Um, this is a phage similarity matrix. And um, what I've highlighted are actually the two phages I looked at, this P57 and P4H. And you can see that their genomic similarity is very far. It um, actually looks like 0% with um, this MASH algorithm I used. Um, but there are a lot more to, discuss, to look at and see if any of the other ones have really different mechanisms. And we also have a lot of bacteria to test it again. These are all of our E-Tech um, strains in-house. So there's a lot of work to go, and we're hoping to get some good stuff. 
So, um, oh, acknowledgements real quick. So, um, everybody at Epi Biome, Rebecca, Alex, Ryan, Hobbs, Manuela, Mache, Michelle, Will, and Jens all did stuff for this project. And in particular, our close collaborators at OSU, Professor Matt Sullivan and his students, Christina, Dean, Natalie, Lauren, and Shawin. Oh, and the army of undergrads. They have so many undergrads. Um, so, thank you. Thanks a lot. Do we have any questions? Got this one here. Oh, it's coming from the other side, the microphone. Do you think you'd be able to use nanopore sequencing to kind of move away from a natural phage to a engineered phage? Or do you think that's something that's just outside of the scope of what you're looking to do? Um, so how would you want to use the nanopore, um, as in to design one, or you right. still have to create it's, it? <laughs> that's the hard so part, you still have to engineer the phage, but if you're able to kind of study the bacteria a little more directly to be able to look at what phage might be able to actually still continue to work and kill the bacteria. Yes, that's actually the ultimate goal of this project. So what we're really trying to understand, my like 10-year, 20-year goal is to understand that if you give me the phage and the bacterial genome, I can tell you whether they will interact or not. And then eventually, can you design the best phage going forward? But I think the first step is just understanding what's going on and being able to yeah, learn from what's out there. OK, we're going to have to save all the questions or the other questions for the panel.